And the thing about it is, if you go to a prison, you've taken away alcohol, drugs, women, all your vices are gone. And you've never seen so many people read the Bible mm. or read the Quran or have Bible meetings. They're extremely spiritual people. They've been in prison for years and they haven't had any distractions. And you realize these are really good people that just need a little help. What's going on? Welcome back to another episode of the Iron Deep Podcast. I got John McLaughlin on the show with me. What's going on, John? Hey, Brett. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. I'm a fan of the show. Uh, listen to your other podcasts, and thank you for having me on Iron Deep. Yes, yes. Greatly thank appreciate you. it. Yeah, thank you so much for being on the show. We have a very interesting topic uh, that John uh, has actually just launched a book. He's been an entrepreneur most of his life, started some businesses and been really, really successful, had some failures along the way, just like we all have, right? Uh, but but most of his successes has just been rising to the top in the entrepreneurship. But today we're really going to focus on uh, a book that you actually wrote. It's called Lifeline to a Soul. And really the topic was about you entered into the season of life and I think that you wanted to make a difference. You wanted to make an impact. And you actually found yourself teaching in a prison, <laughs> entrepreneurship of all places. Um, and we're really just going to dive into that today, John. Before I just talk about that, let's just talk about you. Like, who is John McLaughlin? Okay, great. Well, thank you. Uh, I got into entrepreneurship in a, in a very roundabout way. I'm not a risk taker, or at least I don't think I am. Uh, when I got out of college, my father was starting his own company. He invited me to come work with him, and I thought it would be a very risky proposition. We were working out of the dining room, and I thought, well, this is going to be you know, a lot of time that when we go out of business or if we go out of business that I could be wasting. So I told him, I'll work with you for two years, but that's it. Uh, after that, I'm going to go somewhere safe. And that was 1987. Here we are, 2023. I'm still working in the same industry for the same business. Wow. And I learned along the way that entrepreneurship, although it seems the, like the risky move, a, putting your fate in your someone else's hand is the risky move. Going to work for somebody else and giving them that control is much riskier because if you're working for yourself, well, you can make changes along the way. And if thing, if you have struggles like we did, you just change direction. Find a way to bring value to your market. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I very unlikely entrepreneur, but once I got into it, I would never go work for somebody else like a lot of people. Um yeah, I'm, I get up I'm into. The exact, I'm the exact same way. It's hard to. It'd be hard to go yeah. to an interview and in, in for another job. <laughs> for sure. Can you imagine, right? Or somebody else telling you how to do something? It just goes completely against your nature once you get a taste of it. And it's a great life. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. You look forward to work every day. I always do. For sure. Because you don't know what's going to happen. You, you know, it's completely unpredictable. Uh, you're not just doing the same job over and over. Um, what happened though to me was I was in a small company. And I realized I had to get re-educated. I was losing track. I was using old software, old programs. And my customers are telling me, why are you using this old stuff? This isn't current. You need to get current. And I was thinking, well, how am I going to do that? You know, when you're working for yourself, there's no training program in place. Mm -hmm. So I went back to school and I got an MBA. It took me five years, one class at a time, going at night. Great experience. I learned a lot. I applied it. I learned how to stay current. And as we were graduating, somebody told me, hey, do you realize this MBA qualifies you to teach at a community college, which I didn't know. And I was like, well, I'm going to do that. And I'm the kind of person, once I get my mind on something, I'm going to play it out. You know, you learn determination is what gets you where you want to go more so than skill set or anything like that. So I'm trying and trying and trying to get into community colleges for literally seven years, went back, got a teaching certificate and you know, tried different things, was a guest speaker, met everybody I could possibly meet in the field and nothing. And one day I saw an application and it said, uh, looking for an entrepreneurship instructor at a minimum security prison. And the reason I remembered it is they had put that out six months before and I had applied and they didn't call me and I was sure they would call me. They didn't even need an MBA. It was just some business experience preferred. So what I did this time on the application, they have a place where you put your, your teaching philosophy. And the first time I did it, I put, you know, engage the learner and what I thought they wanted to hear. Mm -hmm. This time I wrote in, in all caps, there is absolutely no reason for you to not interview me for this job. Because <laughs> if you hire me, I will put the same energy into it that I did to take my little startup business from the dining room to an industry leader. And I said, oh, boy, they'll hate that. They'll never call me once they see that. But I was, it felt good to write it, you know? <laughs> yeah. Next day, the phone rings. We would like to interview you for the job at the minimum security prison. So what do you know? I just had to get their attention, I guess. But it got me in there. 
And to be honest, if it didn't take seven years to get there, I would have turned that job down. Mm -hmm. They interviewed me in the prison. We walked around the prison and I'm seeing these big, scary guys. And I'm thinking, wow, I am badly outnumbered here. Anything could happen. They show me the classroom and I'm going to be all by myself. There's it's in a bunk room. There's 50 guys sleeping in the next room and there's 10 guys in the class and me. And I'm thinking there's no guard in here with me. I got no telephone. What? Are, this is going to be awful. <laughs> and, uh, but I wanted to teach so bad. I was like, I'm not turning it down. This is it. It's, it's this or nothing. I'll probably never get this opportunity. So I took it. And as we're packing up for the, after the interview and basically they offered me a job, I took it and I said, okay, tell me, what are we doing? There's a riot. And they all just laughed and said, that'll never happen. I said, no, no, it's okay. I'm going to take the job, but I'm not scared. I just want to know, you know, do I crawl into the desk? You know, do I push a button? Do I, do I have a weapon? What, what do we do? Right. Cause it's going to happen. And they were like, this will never happen here. This is minimum security prison. This will never happen. And I think that's what a lot of people think is mm -hmm. these are scary people. They're violent. They're dangerous. I'm going to be all alone. They're, they're going to jump me. You know, of course it never happened. Um, but it, that's the mindset that I had. And, and, you know, my first class I get in there and I realize after doing it for a little while, these guys aren't much different than me. I did some really dumb things when I was their age too. Uh, I just got lucky. You know, I didn't get caught. Uh, these guys got caught and they're sorry. You know, they want to do better and teaching entrepreneurship came naturally to me. And for a lot of these guys, it's their best move because you come out with a felony and it's hard to find a job. Mm -hmm. And like I told them, if you can find a way to bring value to your marketplace, be it landscaping or car detailing or whatever you want to do, whatever you're good at, we're not going to ask you about your background, right? We're just going to take the value that you give us and thank you for it and pay you for it. So, and you'd be amazed the entrepreneur spirit that's in there that is, was just misdirected at an early age. It just needed a little guide. Yeah. So yeah, definitely. Uh, Here's a qu quick question just on that. So you said that this ad was out for, for six months and you applied for it, but I guess it hadn't been filled. So obviously <laughs> there's not a lot of people chomping in the bit to, to take this sort of position. Uh, can you, Give us your just feedback on that, like why. I think you mentioned that a little bit, but what's your feedback on, um, right? If you want to make an impact, I mean, this is just a great way to to impact people's lives, but but not a lot of people were chomping at the bit, and you did. So can you talk to us about that? Certainly. Um, when you when you start a small business, you have very few resources, right? And what I learned about teaching in there is these guys don't need much direction. They need a little direction, and they need a little help and a little guidance. Um but they're just like me and you. Now, when you walk in and you see these guys in matching prison uniforms and they're, they've got tattoos and they're, these guys, all they do is lift weights. They're all huge. <laughs> I mean, they're very physically intimidating to survive in a prison. You need to be physically intimidating. Mm -hmm. So your first impression is this is a very dangerous place. And these are dangerous people. They, they're trying to look that way. Mm -hmm. You know, they've got a walk about them that says, don't mess with me. And, and they lift weights and they're big, strong guys. And they got tattoos and you get to know them and you're like, well, this is a facade. This is how they have to act to survive in this environment. Right. But don't judge them for that because they're a lot like me and you, they just got put in this system early. So I would encourage anybody who wanted to reach out. Um, these are people that need help and they need, they're not getting much in the system. The system isn't designed to rehabilitate necessarily or educate. It's designed to warehouse mm -hmm. more than anything and mm -hmm. put people where they're being and keep them there and keep counting them and, you know, feed them minimally. Um, so I think it's a great place. If you're looking to serve, you'll get a lot of bang for your buck teaching. Mm -hmm. Cause like I say, you don't have to give them much, just a little bit and they'll go a long, long way. Yeah. I mean, I've got two guys working for me now that I met there Wow. and they're doing great. Wow. That's so, awesome. So they actually yeah. got out and now they work for you. Yep. Wow. Yeah. One of them taught me into it when <laughs> he took my class and I was like, no, nope, nope, I'm not going to make any promises. And he kept asking, he kept asking, he kept asking. And I was like, he obviously really wants this really bad. Um, so I said, okay, I'll give you a trial, six month trial. And I said, well, then we're going to have a conversation to make sure we're both in a good place. But we never had the conversation. He just took the ball and ran with it. Uh, it's been just amazing. Uh, and in addition to that, a very good friend of mine. So, mm -hmm. you know, you, you don't want to judge people for their past transgressions because we've all done things we're not proud of, right? Yeah. For sure. Yeah, definitely. So I, before the show, you were just talking about like, this has been one of the most impactful things, not only in their life, but in your life. Can, can you talk about just the impact? Because right when you first got started, you 
were kind of scared, filled with fear, but obviously somewhere along the way that changed and you were like, wow, this is exactly where I'm supposed to be. And, and it really transformed your life as well. It, it did. Um, my mother was a, a minister, uh, but I was never a very, very spiritual person. You know, I went to church and all that stuff. Um, but somebody, I, I got into it with, uh, somebody, just a discussion and we were talking about grace and they said, um, grace is what defines us as Christians. It's the one thing that Christian Christianity has that other religions don't and, and grace being getting, not getting what you do deserve. And let me say it back, uh, getting what you don't deserve and not getting what you do deserve. Mm-hmm. Right. So grace is given to everyone. Right. So as I'm in there, I'm realizing these guys, they need to be forgiven. They need to be set in the right direction and gone out and told, you know, sin no more sort of thing. So it did have a very spiritual element to it. And the thing about it is, if you go to a prison, you've taken away alcohol, drugs, women, all your vices are gone. I mean, you can still get drugs, in prison, but for most guys, it's not there. And you've never seen so many people read the Bible mm. or read the Koran or have Bible meetings. They're extremely spiritual people. They've been in prison for years and they haven't had any distractions. And you realize these are really good people that just need a little help. Mm -hmm. So it it made me almost, yeah, very, that's the reason I wrote the book. I really want to change people's perspective on these as evil, bad people that can't be trusted, you know, because they're not any, any more than you and I are. Yeah. So it did lead me down that path, which I didn't expect to go. (laughs) (laughs) Definitely. So how long, uh, how, how long were you in that uh, position at this minimum security prison? Almost three years. Okay. I started in 2017. The, if, if you read the book, you'll realize that the more I got and started empowering these guys, the less the system liked having me there mm. because I was working. I mean, if I, if I want to get you to start your own business, I got to have you believe in yourself. If I can't do that, I, all the business instruction in the world isn't going to matter at all. You've got to be confident enough to try it. I've got to convince you you can do it first. So I spent a lot of time on motivation, confidence, you know, getting out of this cycle because prison, going to prison is a cycle. Uh, recidivism is very, very high because when you don't train somebody and they haven't been on a computer in two or three years, they've lost touch with technology. They don't know what an app is. They don't know anything. They come out, they try to get a job with a felony. Well, they're almost unmarketable. Mm-hmm. So what are their choices? Go back and do what they know to do. They got to feed their families. The children got to eat. Well, the choices are very limited. So that becomes a cycle of uh, despair, really. And it doesn't just hurt the person in the prison. It hurts their families who aren't, they don't have a provider now. They don't have the direction of a father or a mother. So, um, yeah, definitely. I mean, I totally That's agree a, with uh, just, just empowering these guys. And I want to dive into that a little bit, a little bit more. So you're, you're giving them hope, right? They're, because uh, a lot of times they're just knocked down, they're kicked, and 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 just just their self confidence is is just way down. Even though they they look like they have it all together, not all together, but just strong and and confident men and women. Um, but again, that's that's their prison's job sometimes just to just to warehouse them is just to take their self-esteem and, and way lower it so when you're empowering them you're giving them hope and you said that the prison didn't really like that the system didn't really like that can you talk to us about that a little bit more what was it that the prison didn't like about you empowering and giving these men hope uh i think what it was is I, they were getting a little bit of their swagger back uh and that is certainly something that they don't want to see uh they want to keep you under their thumb. And, and honestly, if I'm running a prison, I understand that that's how we have to do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, we can't play favorites because once we start that, we lose control. So we want to control people. We, the best way to do that, it's the Stanford experiment. You just dehumanize them. I don't want to see you as a person. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm coming in and saying, Hey, you guys can be amazing people. You just need to rethink your future. And here's some, here's a motivational book. And here's an information on how to buy and sell real estate. Um, and every time I, that they see these guys growing it's exactly what they're trying to undo so Mm -hmm. sooner or later i knew we were going to come to a head and it certainly did um and you know i knew they were going to show me the door eventually and they (laughs) did which was you know (laughs) not totally unexpected but it was still worth it because i wasn't going to change my style and the first time that they dictated to me how they wanted me to run my class would be my last day i wasn't going to put up with that uh because 
I owed it to these people. I felt like, you know, the grace of God bestowed on me that trouble that I didn't get in that I should have at 20 years old, that would have changed my life forever. Mm. Uh, I felt like this is my way of paying it back, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And so I wasn't going to change what I was doing. Yeah. So how, how long ago was that, that you was stopped working at that prison? Uh, 2019. It was right before COVID actually, maybe two or three months before COVID. So that would have ended it anyway. All programs ceased for years and, uh, you know, they wouldn't let anybody in and out. Uh, so that was going to come to a close anyhow, but it came up right at the end of 2019. Um, they basically told me I couldn't come back. I didn't have the credentials to be there, whatever they wanted to say that it, to make it very clear, they didn't want me in there. And, uh, you know, that's the way it ended, but I kind of knew it would, I was just doing what they didn't want me to do. But at the same time, I wasn't working for the prison. I was working for the college. So they couldn't really tell me not to do it, but they could, these are people that are used to not having a lot of people, uh, say no to them. You know what I mean? Yeah. They're, they're used to getting things done their way. Yeah, for so. sure. For sure. So what, what, what's life been like since then? So you actually, this has been so transformational and impactful for you that you wrote the book lifeline to a soul. Um, so obviously, you know, to spend that time of putting your stories and everything into this book and what you've learned, uh, what's life been like since 2023, have you done other things, uh, in, with prisoners, I, I mean, obviously, uh, with people with felonies, you've hired a couple. But talk to us about your life now. Sure, I appreciate it. We um we hired a guy that I didn't he was in the camp. I didn't know him from the camp to work with us, and he told me that he wanted to start a program to help people coming out of prison. And I said, "You got to be kidding! I've got you know hundred hours of material that is designed exactly for this demographic." Uh, his name is Tavares James, and me and him started a education program about about a year ago. And we do classes now. We bring people in and we're, we, we focus on two areas, financial literacy and entrepreneurship, because you really need how to learn to handle money first before you can start a business, because you're going to have cash flow problems, obviously, if you if you don't, if you can't save. Uh, so, yeah, I'm still teaching, not as often, but and I'm on the outside now, which is great. I don't have any limitations. I can actually bring in PowerPoint slides and use the internet and you know it's been a good time and i'm working with a really good motivator we're a very good team uh it's all his company i'm just a volunteer but it's it's fun to start something again that's what i like is taking nothing and making it into something yeah so yeah and if you go to the website we'll, we you've got some material on there and it'll show you the classes we're doing and yeah and uh, you're the person um tavares right he started this but right. he he has a story behind that he was a from from just his own experience, correct? Can you talk to us about that? Oh, absolutely. Yep, and he'd be good on your show for sure. Um, I, he hasn't talked to me too much about it, and, I, and I'm not one to, yeah. to pry, but he went through the prison experience for sure, and he realized that there was not much in there to help, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and he decided that he wasn't going to come back to prison. And you see people in there, when you're in there teaching, there's people that have made that decision, and there's people that haven't. Um, and the people that aren't coming back they're not coming back. I, I can help them a little, but they really are going to, they've made this firm decision in their mind that this is not the lifestyle they want. Mm -hmm. What's surprising is there's, there's some people that are okay with the prison experience. They figure I'll come in and, uh, in this prison, there was work release. So I can save up a bunch of money and I'll get out with, you know, sometimes 10, $15,000. I can have a big party with this money that took me five years to make. And then, uh, you know, Sooner or later, I'll get in trouble again, and I'll come back, and we'll do it all over again. This will be a, my life. This is what I'm going to do. But Tavares made that decision that he, he wasn't going to do that, and he actually came out with a an outline, a, a program, and we've been working together. We do slides and stuff together and focusing on the same things, uh, financial literacy and um, also entrepreneurship because it's a good direction to go. Yeah. Because the sure. one thing I did learn in as, as a prison teacher, they gave me – a lot more time than I needed to teach entrepreneurship. We met for 11 weeks and it was nine hours a week. I mean, it was a lot of time. And I started teaching financial literacy because the questions I was getting were, um, well, how do I get a debit card? How does that work? How do I open a checking account? What's an IRA? And people that had no financial understanding at all. But if you look at the statistics, most people are in prison for financial reasons. I mean, they did something to gain money, but they don't understand money. Mm -hmm. And that's a really dangerous road to go down. And, you know, just living beneath your means and saving a little bit and learning to invest 
And you'll like this. I told the guys, when you get out and you've got your $15,000, let's go look for some real estate. Mm -hmm. You know, real estate doesn't care if you have a felony. It doesn't true. matter. You know, <laughs> let's just that. put it down. <laughs> right. Yeah. Let's put a down payment on and let's find some, let's find a tenant. And, you know, you coming from a real estate background. I, I thought that was the best move for these guys, you know, to, cause real estate lets you can start with one and, and you can grow. Yeah. You know, I and there's that. no telling. Yeah. And that's obviously, yeah. you know, I've been in real estate for, for years and uh, that's just a great point. They don't ask you, uh, I do a lot of closing. They don't ask you if you have a felony. Um, on the, any of the title work or anything like that. So, um, that's a great place. And I think again, entrepreneurship, I love entrepreneurship. I love creating and growing. And I've have a friend that has been in prison and it has been a struggle. He actually worked for us for I think about five years and, but it's been a struggle for him. Um, just finding a job, right? Uh, it's just such a, such a struggle. So I think it's such a, such a great thing that you're doing. And well, one of the things on this show that we love to just, we're talking to entrepreneurs, we're talking to business owners, but we're also asking them, hey, like what's in your life that you can use your experience to give back? So can you talk about just again um, to the audience out there, uh, ways that you've used your experience to give back to prisoners, guys that have had, had a felony, um, but what are some other ways that you've seen other guys just to give back from their own experiences as, as business and entrepreneurship? Uh, I mean, if you find the, I, the best way to learn entrepreneurship is, is from somebody who's been there. You can buy all the books you want. You can uh, read up on it, but you need to find somebody who went down that road, made the early mistakes that everybody makes and survived mm. because they can help you more than anybody else. And, and I know you've got uh, a group, right? You, you do your retreat and you get the entrepreneurs, the Christian entrepreneurs together and you all learn from each other. Right. Yeah. So I would say reach out. Cause this is an experience. If you're a successful entrepreneur, you've been down a tough road. I, it's not easy. It's one of those things that only the determined people make it. You've, you've got to get it in your head that I'm just going to do this. Um, and if you were looking for a way to give back, uh, if you found somebody that had made a mistake when they were young and had a prison sentence for it, you know, and you wanted to be a mentor to this person, you can change their life because mm. they need help. This, this demographic's not getting any information or education, uh, but a lot of them have that entrepreneurial spirit. Mm. So to reach out, I mean, you can go to any prison and volunteer or meet guys on the outside, uh, halfway houses, places where people are getting out. That's where we teach a lot. Mm. And you'll see guys that are fresh out. And they've got a lot of questions. Now they're surrounded by all these temptations again. And it's a difficult transition because they're not typically prepared, but to give one of them a little guidance or just give them a chance, just give them an opportunity. Uh, it's a powerful thing and you will be rewarded. I mean, not always, I can't say it's hundred percent going to work, but if you find the right person, um, uh, it's amazing what they can accomplish if given that second chance. Amen. Uh, but you're in the position to give it or not, you know, it's, it's, up, it's up to you, but to, I guess I would say this too. Just don't close your mind. This guy's made a mistake. Okay. He did his time. He, believe me, time in prison is not easy. Mm -hmm. uh, he's out now. He's sorry. He wants to go in a different direction and, and just believe in him, you know, give him that chance, uh, find a way to incorporate him into your business or help him start his own thing. Mm. It's um, I've got at the end of my book, if you go to the epilogue, I've got a list of seven or eight guys that I'm in a prison that are out and running successful businesses. Mm. And the nice part about that is when they start a business, if it's successful and they need to hire, they often hire people with a checkered pass because that's the guys they met in prison and they realize, okay, he's okay. He just mm -hmm. got caught. He made the mistake. So yeah, it, it helps a lot, a lot, you know, it yeah. helps more than one person. Oh, for sure. And it's like, kind of like that, just that spread. Um, and, and that's just so good. And I think it's just so good just to find something to, to give back, to make a difference in people's lives. And this is just a way that you've done it, John. I, I love what you're doing. I think it's just making such a difference in people's lives and, uh, and you have your book and where can someone get their book if they're interested in the lifeline to a soul? Oh, thank you, Brett. It's available everywhere. Uh, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Goodreads. Uh, if you want to autograph copy, if you want to go to my website, lifeline to a soul.com. There's a place you can leave your email. We're going to have a drawing. I'll be happy to send a, an autograph copy to anybody who'd like it. Uh, mention the show. You know, we can say the first few people that mention the show, I'll be happy to send an autograph copy. It's a good story. It actually is being received a lot better than I expected. People like the story. It's an, you know, it's a story about going to a place that you'll probably never go. Mm -hmm. And my goal in writing, it was to take you in the fence with me 
and show you what I saw as objectively as possible. No, just here's what he said. Here's what we did. And it's a glimpse into a world that you probably wouldn't see otherwise. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping you'll leave as I did with the realization that we should be helping these people more than we are. Mm -hmm. Right. And these people can do great things in their life if we give them help. And if we don't, they're probably going to end up back in prison. A lot of them, you know, so it's an, it's a chance to get in. And, and when you change one person's life, you think, okay, I changed one guy's life. Well, you change his whole downstream. You changed his children's life, his grandchildren's life. You know, it, this continues. So it's very well worth doing. I love that. I love that. That's awesome. Well, guys, yeah. make sure you guys go check out the book with John McLaughlin, Lifeline to a Soul. John, I appreciate being on the podcast today. It's been awesome hearing your story. Thank you so much for making a difference and uh, wish you the best, buddy. I appreciate it, Brett. Thank you very, very much. It's been an honor and a, and a privilege. 